in the book, the opening uh, epigraph of this anthology, uh, the Romanian and Australian anthology, begins with a scene, uh, I don't know if you've, if you've looked at it already, if you've opened up your book, but it begins with a scene of a young girl lingering at the doorway of her house. Her name is Sophia, and sitting with uh, her family in the garden is a man twice her age. Uh, he's a self-made millionaire, and he's seeking a poor but educated wife. And he wants to take his young wife with him, he has told Sophia's uncle, so that together they can arm themselves with picks and shovels and uncover the archaeological remains of Homer's Troy, which he believes that he can locate. The man believes Sophia is the perfect young woman to be his wife because she knows the great epics she's familiar with. Um, Sophia can't decide. She stands in the doorway with uncertainty. She has to choose either to go into the garden and marry this man who's twice her age, or retreat back into the house, close the door, and remain forever. Okay, so students of narratology would recognize Sophia's dilemma. The call to adventure has reached her ears, and she stands at the threshold of her journey, and the fabulous forces of the wide world, having singled her out for whatever reason, are waiting for her to begin her adventure and her transformation into her potential self, to become part of the world instead of being a child, let's say. Uh, that's the path of the hero on their journey. It's the great adventure of our lives, calling all of us, and yet there's always another voice repeating, stay a while. And had Sophia, poor, educated young woman that she is, picked up this collection that we're here to launch today, she would have encountered in the first English contribution the sage advice on the subtleties of desire in Augusta Supple's Move On, where our protagonist, Rosie, is a huntress on the trail of a new home, somewhere to rest in the sweet amber hum of pleasant dreams, like an insect empress renewed inside the honeycombed warmth of a trembling hive, the worn rugs and cracked teacups and total toasters of her old life left to gather dust of long gone lovers. In Anna Marie Belgian's Uncle Sully and the Baroness, there's a proud man, like a broken Ulysses, brooding on the injustice of a life well lived. He has bedded and beaten his way to the arse end of the earth, only to find himself ensnared in the slings and arrows of community housing, until one chance encounter at a Sunday market where a green-eyed Penelope pokes him in the rear with a white umbrella. In Taser Abdullah's Maya, it begins with a voice calling outside Gloria's door. There's hollering in strangely familiar tones, and an old woman's eyes are wide and wet with tears where she finds what is standing on the other side, four children that are born from strangers' bodies, for whom a childless grandmother lights her candles and speaks prayers under fragile breath, weaving the Maya in the air like an invisible mandala. It's an elemental connection for Daniel Mira's Layla, who is the poor prisoner of an unfulfilled void, who hears a knocking on the glass and turns to wonder at a little girl standing outside, amidst a passing parade of indifference, grinning a toothy smile for Layla's listless eyes, and stoking the fires of a dimming spirit reaching in from that other world beyond the boundaries of man, where each dewy dawn ripens unbounded on the earth. In Alona Kruger, Kruger's Maybe Forever, she sings the wishes with soft wings landing in rippling light, eyes with the music in their cloudy gaze, and cherubim sightings in a stranger's crowd. And after a cup full of honey, she sees the coming of impossible creatures who stamp their feet under a liturgical moon, and the wind is giving speeches, and the magic hour lingers long in endless moments. In Lodacris by Christopher Summer, draws the strangers out of the ordinary, all the horsepower of a 78 Lotus Esprit doing doughies in the driveway, and the driving force of his tale of workplace misadventure is a father with a vandal's heart who leaves his mark upon the lowest places and sticks one arm out the window and gives the rest of us the thin finger and the thumb. In Danny Draper's open road, there's a wanting for a driver of another kind. This one has been usurped by a plague of cancelled plans and abandoned parades. 
But the only traveller is an autumn breeze bringing the ghostly breath of absent friends and missing faces. There's a vision of waves breaking over empty beaches and the coquettish lips of an autumn sun, sky blue-lipped and softly filled with anointed siren silence. In Peter Cartwright's roads to redemption in driving to Mount Isa, three days and nights against the myth of distance, piled into a utility with an anomaly of baggage and photographs, staying between the lines of promises to a daughter, laughing in the darkness just outside the curtains, and hoping for a gladness soon to come, rising like the gathering babble of a river whose water breaks winter ice. The thought of common sense causes, causes coins to drop in C.A. Broadridge's hunting fantasia. It's a magic garden where two lovers are trying to find the common ground of a shared speech, summoning up sensations and creations from spaces between the sounds and their deeper meanings. And then the question is, what words do you offer the dying? In Anna Radovich's last breath, poetry becomes a parting gift, where closed eyes and silent forms soaks in the leaping waters of muddy streams, lyricism bobs in billabongs. The mute interior turns toward the shining sun, one unwinding heart lighting the sweet symphony of a recent reader's consolations. In Victoria Cartwright's Under a Tree, another poet's form of consolations take place. Here it is the shade beneath the swaying boughs that bring comfort to a wounded soul, and the limbs above us breathing out their scent to distant snow and cool rain on faraway hills with a flowing wind and soothing shade take spirits to a distant home. The leaves are curled in Henry Griffith's April, cruel, cruelest month, where a path cracking bracken leads a tour of dying fields, and nature blushes in its innocence, a feeble run of rain after unseasonable summer, falling like a single tear creeping down stubbled cheeks. A proof rock conscious teacher finds the still point in Louise Loom's tale of classroom catastrophe. She reads the impolite lyric, uh, lyricism of youth and sees beginnings in our ends, an absence pale as a dying child, clutching shape without colour, paralysed force, gesture without motion, clinging to the crossroads of death's other kingdom, its stillness cradled in her arms for brief eternity. In Lydia, Kajijan, Kajijans, sorry, mispronouncing her name almost, so, uh, in, uh, her piece is Bonnie and Clyde in Istanbul. But in that piece, you return to the Polish village with all your windows down, and your brahms out loud, your sucking smoke and setting your specks, and some thoughts of self immolation to suppress, that you've practiced long and wide at that. Seen the impossible shores and prognosticated from dead poets and prophets. And though life is brief and art is long, you cannot help but stay a while inside the lingering of a song. Mark Perusik, the sings of songs of bleeding snow. It falls with returning youth in delicate flakes of scanty form, one momentary puff of private cloud, passing fancy of fickle weather. An ordinary path of thin white cover for the ground, and yet the moment creeps higher in the memory, rising through the mental mist over mountains of experience, a flowing river roaring in its wake into seas of vast infinity. The factory of Dorian Silescu was once the centrifuge of a universal village around which the apartments built themselves, as if emerging from the earth, the mystic engines of industry. And the children circled round for school, awed by the sacred place of promise, a portal through which one day they might reach a future. Then comes the fall and fires and ruin, as doors and windows drop down into the wreck of a world still orbiting a barren star. There's an ominous urgency in the football diary of Moni Stanilla, whose epistle begins with an inhalation of the bedsheets under flower light and the conditional futures kick back and forth in the present tensions. The hope of children, the loneliness of the deathbed, who one is and will ever be, all potential wavers on the white line like the arbitrary judgments of a faceless referee. We are neither ahead nor behind, 
always returning on the paths of time, as Melinda Smith reminds us in the feudal state. We are beginning by degrees. Each room and doorway is a threshold soon forgotten, a setting glass that leaves behind a loop, and the trunks of trees accumulate in the endless air, with a static charge of plenty of potential tingling from the storm in your fingertips. Matilda Hart's Melisande is the story of renewal in contemporary times. Where one heart breaks, the kingdom crumbles, the consolations of civilization, avocado, brunch, and Bloody Marys get swapped for empty shelves, and night submits the growing clutter of an unloved life. And yet, the normal joys and fears persist, and those who endure the long night come to see the blue eyes of the breaking dawn. In Kate Lumley's On Being Forced to Ride Five Miles to Big School, is a creation myth of sorts, where a young girl meets the nature of the air, the in-betweenness all around her, form and colour, the speech of trees, the sign of feathers sermonising on the wing, turning and turning in the widening heavens, like the wheels by which the earth itself is steering through the cosmic web of all creation. And we come to 125 corners in Norm Fairbanks Quartets. The doors of night are shutting on the red ribbons of lunar light, are cut to sharp as celluloid edge. The despair of distance, thinning rivers of genetic flow and potholes in the pavement that loom like open graves and broken cement, hard and chipped as grinning teeth, sharp and jagged as endless grief. Sunshine Pritchard supplies us with the challenge, huddling fearfully by the boardwalk, faceless in the crowd and streets and beaches, the windy cannonade of swirling sands and brutal winds, and visions of Prince Hamlet, who steps into the abyssal sea of troubles while, in short, we are afraid and almost at times a fool, but we have wept and fasted and wept and prayed, and Prince, who tenders in the tempest, turns back to us no worse for wear. But as if a magic lantern with Thomas Thorpe's Witwick on the screen, we glimpse the soft blue, not blue, it's not blue, the soft glow of blue snow, the tricky scent, uh, through the window on a stair, and silhouettes sharp on chimney grooves and fields of trees and muffled Christmas windows, one quiet little town Tiny as a snow globe held up in your hand. May knows insistent anaphor anaphoric ode to Edouard Lewis is a kind of manifesto for the fire of influence where one author sets the heat beneath another and passion, which is not always born sweetly, comes to aim the eyes of an indifferent world to look upon the injustice done to one man, one family, one village, one generation to the next from one end of the earth to ours, here at home and far away. The year that water came for Lara Taylor begins with an empty nest in the dry riverbed. Then one morning at the parched mouth she sees the snaking trickle of far-flung floods coming into town, and soon an overflowing on the land, awash with the heralding flocks of pelicans fishing in the rushing waters, and joeys leaping on greener pastures and fishermen reel in their fleshy catches. And hairdressers and yoga teachers pop up from the water ground and cormorants spread their wings over the watery, watery weir. A day that sparkles and shines in memory lasts three years for Lysel Herman, tucked in a tiny mountain village after the war. The Russian forces commandeer their backyard and grandmother sews stitches in the soldiers' uniforms to make ends meet and reward the children with sweets from the commissary. When the combatants pull up stumps for Vienna, the refugees flow behind them on the march in carts and wagons, down the meadows rich with acorns and wood for little whistles, and the mother by the fireside at night, her face glowing in the highway light. And then at last, uh, on the far side of his journey, we come along the river with Mahela Christescu, where the poet, Sophia-like, stands in her indecision, speaking to the surface of rippling consciousness, and if it weren't for some senseless belly aches, 
in the love of all things atomized and unrequited, we wouldn't be here today watching poets troll for wells, preparing time for the castles and kingdoms yet to come. So the one thing I haven't mentioned about this anthology is that every piece begins with an epigram. epigram I believe trying to answer what the truth of love is. Uh, it's a secret theme of this anthology, maybe not so secret, but it's the theme of this anthology. Uh, so I'm just going to leave it with, uh, I'm going to leave you uh, and all of you who contribute to this with uh, some words from the late great Gore Vidal, who wrote as a very young man, 23 years of age, under a pseudonym, uh, I believe it was, he was writing under the pseudonym Libra at the time, who said, a work of art, like an act of love, is our one small yes in a vast surrounding no. <laughs> so thank you all for lending your unique yes to these acts of love and art. This luminous compendium ties two continents together in these rare consummations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. For your time.